All right, so what we're going to do, the exercise, is to do a first draft of our um, ERD, Entity Resource Diagram, for our bug tracker system. And so we'll do this a little bit interactive. I'll be asking questions and getting feedback from my class. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of awkward silence and until someone talks. Um, and so that's on you guys. And so this will be interactive and I may even call on you. So the option of not interacting is not an option. So pay attention, be awake. Um, and so these are the requirements that we kind of uh, went through um, a little bit earlier. And so there's, there's a lot of requirements. Um, it kind of starts up at the top that core entities are bugs and users. Now we are choosing, at least for our first draft, Umlet is our modeling software. Again, there's other options out there uh, of which I was asked, hey, I want to try this other software. Are you okay with it? Yeah, I'm fine as long as you know how to work your software of choice. Do a Google search, find modeling software, you know, do best modeling software 2023 there's plenty of options this is just an option and it's free and I know how to work it um, and so we can kind of start by dragging one of these objects or classes and these are just all templates but we can just drag this box so if you click this box go ahead and drag it over this would be the start of our ERD. Um, and this object or class represents uh, a single document, if you will. And so if you click on this, notice what will be changing are down here in the properties. And so, you know, looking at this, we've got a little bit of syntax here and getting used to the syntax to get the different symbols on the diagram itself. Again, the diagram is just the image of what we're planning on building here. Um, and so, you know, I noticed this underscore here and an underscore at the end, you know, just what happens if you remove the underscore, I'm assuming it's no longer underlined, right? So you kind of see that by changing the symbols, in this properties window, it changes what what it draws on the screen. Um, so what are our entities? And this is the easiest question, so the, we're going to make this interactive. What are our two entities that we should start with? Bugs and users. All right, you've answered the easiest question, bugs and users. So let's, Connor is now free of, of uh, answering other questions until we get around to him again. Uh, so. Let's put the word user here. And let's drag another object class over here. Increase that. And of course, we could copy and paste. But let's, above these two lines, of course, the two lines draw the separator there, the horizontal rule, if you will. We have bug and user. Looking at the requirements here, all database entities, so we have two entities so far, bug and user. Um, we kind of talked about this the other day uh, if I go to mongodb.com, by the way, going here and signing in, maybe you guys can do this with me here. Um, this is actually a little bit of a pain, and I, I'm always doing it because I'm always authenticating. Um, remember, there's Compass. And we could authenticate to our database using Compass. So if I kind of come in here, I'm going to click on Connect. I'm going to click on Compass. You have to put I have Compass installed. Uh, I have Compass installed. The link 
And then here, here, let's copy the connection string. Now you replace obviously your password um, appropriately. And so I'm gonna click on new connection in compass and you're welcome to paste. Now my password, uh, I'm going to remove this on my screen. Actually, it's not like you guys are going to go into my databases and change anything. Um, but let's let's go ahead and pretend that you might. So let me open up my password. Are we doing this as well? You're welcome to. You don't have to. I guess my point is is that by using Compass, I could just click the green connect button. And I don't have to put in my username and password every time to get to my databases. Um, yes. Did you put in your password? See right here where it says there's angle brackets and password? You're going to delete everything that I just highlighted and you're going to replace that with your password. You delete everything including the angle brackets, including the less than greater than symbol. And so I'm going to delete everything there. Paste my password that I just copied. And click on connect. Do what now? I, um, let me save, connect, and normal connect? Yeah, there's two buttons. There's a save and connect button. Uh-huh. Oh, well, let's go ahead and save and connect. So I'm going to... Okay, there it goes. So now my, my password is hashed, so let's save and connect. And this will be sample DBs, save and connect. And there we go. Now, um, we did, I personally don't, I always get confused by this, so I have to look it up all the time. Should our collections be singular or plural? When we were doing the retro Amazon, I, I looked it up and it did suggest that the best practice is singular collections. So it's book as opposed to orders, right? That, that probably should have been singular. And conventions matter. So um, let's, let's make our entities here singular going back to Umlet. Okay, so I just wanted to double check that this is user, not users, and bug, not bugs. So the question is a good question. Does it matter if it's capitalized? And yeah, I would say typically your collections are, are capital. Yep. Okay. Um, so whether you're connected via web interface or you're connected via the desktop app, um, Right now, remember in Mongo, if I go back to my database, there are different projects. Okay, and so right now, I'm connected to this project called mflix. Now, this is really where my sample data is, right? So I actually have all my sample databases here as well as some of the just miscellaneous stuff that I've done. Uh, you might choose to create another project because there is a limitation to the free services that they provide, like how much data can you load in a project that's basically given to you for free. So you can have multiple projects so, but, but realize when you have multiple projects, when you create a new project, um, the security that we set up, which includes a database user, 
you're gonna create, if you create a new project, you're gonna create a new database user. Okay, this database user may have the same password, may have a different password. Okay, the point I'm saying here is if you want to create a new project, might not be a bad idea for this, okay, because of the, the limits in Mongo. Um, but realize, you know, you might want to create the same username and same password, and that's, that's up to you. But realize there is a difference. You're going to have to set that back up again. You're going to have to set up the, the username. And also, if you remember network access, um, you set up some, some rules about where you can connect from. Right now, you're probably able to connect from home or maybe, maybe from here. But notice, like, if you're not one of these IP addresses right now, you know, uh, you're not able to, to connect in. So if I were to, like, go to Starbucks and try and work on my Mongo database, well, that IP address is not going to be one of these. Um, so so when, you, when you set up a new project, you have to set up the database access and the network access for that project. Your connection string will then be a little bit different, right? Because you have a different username potentially and a different password potentially. Um, but for now, um, let's create a database called Issue Tracker and a collection named Bug. And if I click on issue tracker and I create another collection, now we have zero documents here, but let's go ahead and create our user collection. And this is, this is how we're starting, right? We have a bug collection and a user collection. Yeah, you gotta, I click this little plus right here to create database first. Database was issue tracker. And I have two collections, one for bug, one for user. Okay, back to the requirements and creating our ERD. We're gonna need to model our relationships. Remember you talked about one-to-one, one-to-many, even mentioned this one-to-squillions, kind of a fun term. Uh, Many-to-many is another one I forgot to list there. The properties of all entities, the data types of your properties. Remember in JavaScript, we'll get into, it doesn't have too many data types, number, string, date, that kind of thing. Primary key must have underscore ID listed at the top. Okay, so what do we do next? What should we add to our ERD? Under user, what should be our first property of our user? And... So username was is, is good, right? So if we kind of go up here, um, let's look at our requirements. Is there a username? No. no. Ah, we do have email address. We do have password. So those would belong under our user. We also have a full name, given name, family name, and role. Okay. But before we do these, what else? Yeah. Aha, that is correct. Let's look at this. The primary key of every document must be named underscore ID and listed at the top. So that gives us some direction. User, let's change in this properties window, let's do underscore ID. And on the notice we have a colon right that separates the identifier from the data type on the left hand side you have the identifier on the right hand side you have a data type which is an object id because it's a mongo database we got object id yep yes
identifier. identifier. Yep. Quotation marks. That's fine, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Just... Yeah, and so um, the, the question becomes in our documents, are the identifiers, are these properties, are they in quotes or not? Okay. Now remember JSON format. JSON format says that they should be in quotes, but it's not a requirement for JavaScript. So to be a little bit more friendly in the JSON world, you can put them in quotes, but it's not a requirement for, for okay. JavaScript. So, like what, what, we're doing, what we were doing with the magnification that's in JSON, typically, yeah. we'd be doing that. Yeah, it, it, it's not a bad idea to put them in quotes. Um, but but you don't have to identify that here okay, okay? Sure. yep so let's go of course if there's a you basically we're talking about a user id so so we're going to call that jack jack has now interacted in this class and so is connor right so what would we change next about our diagram these are the softballs guys the email and password all right let's do that tony has now said, hey, we have an email, colon. What's our data type, Tony? A string. Yeah. How about password? What's our data type there? Another string. Yeah, we can go strings there. What else do we have about our users? Roles. Ah, a role. And I gave you the data type before. What is our role data type? It is a string array. String array. So I would put string array. So a user can have an array of roles, right? You can be a developer, you could be a quality analyst, you could be a business analyst. You could have a bunch of roles, you could have no roles. Okay, so now Drew has interacted. So four people, we've got four, four so far. What else do we got? About our, either, either one, user or bugs. All right, someone's taking the softballs, good. So we've got full name, given name, and family name. Um, let's go back here. Full name, data type string, given name. That was James that gave me this answer, so we'll call that five people interacting. And family name. Now, just as a, you know, in some cultures, your given name, like our given names are our first name, but in some cultures, the given name is not the first name. The given name is the second name, right? So that's why we are kind of saying, hey, the family name, sometimes the family name comes first in some cultures. Okay, so there's a difference between the given and the family. Um, between first and last name. That's why first name and last name, not, not the best identifiers for name. Okay? Um, all right, what else we got? Well, these are the values, so we actually don't have to, we don't have to code the values into here. That is just something to kind of remember for later is the valid roles. Um, so you do a bug too. Yeah, let's do bugs. Um, you need a title. Script. Well, before, what about that? Before that. It said up at the top we need a what? Okay. Yeah. So bugs need an object ID, underscore ID, type of object ID. Then what'd you say, Jacob? Uh, it needs a title. Title, data type. 
string. Description string. Steps to reproduce. I'm guessing that's like the description. So description kind of so this is string. Steps to reproduce string. Yeah. There's another bug. Classification, but like dubbing that you string away. Let's look so classification can you have multiple values can it, can you be approved and unapproved no it's it's just one just a string so let's add classification Okay, so we've got some user fields, we've got some bug fields. Date and time of creation. And also author of bug. And author of bug. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. So date and time. So of creation, what would you call that? Time. Creation time, sure, something like that. How about created on? Created on. So let's let's on on bug. Created on. And what JavaScript data type would that be? Date. You could optionally call it reported on. The bug is reported on a certain day, created on. I like created on, but that's a matter of opinion. Yeah. Um, Max, you said something else. Okay, good. Let's say bug author. Now, let's go. Where does it talk about bug author? Okay. Author of bug. Well, So that's a convention thing. Yeah, you could just call it author. Yeah, it is kind of, it's bug.bugauthor. It could just be bug.author. So I'm, I'm okay with either. Um, actually, I, I do kind of like the, I do kind of just like that. Now, now I want you to imagine your front end, right? And so you're looking at a bug on a website, right? Uh, and you see a bug author, right? Do you see their object ID? No, what do you see? You see their, their name, their, probably their full name, you know? Um, so this author is going to link to a user via their author ID. That's kind of the, the primary key. That's how you're gonna link the two things together. Okay, but you could see that we need to store both the object ID of the user, the user ID, and the full name. Okay, so, so we need to store multiple pieces of information. So I'm going to store author in a, that's a curly brace. This is a sub document. See, see the syntax here. And I'm going to store the underscore ID, which is an object ID about our bug author. I'm going to put a comma there. And I'm going to store the full name, which we already said is a string. And whatever else, maybe we store their email. Maybe we store, this isn't the final answer. This is, this is just a start. Okay, but you, we now have, in users, we have an array of roles. In 
bug, we have a sub document. We have an author property, which is just like, hey, for every bug, there's gonna be an author, and that author is gonna have an ID, which is a user ID, and a full name. And again, you might choose to add more fields here as this develops, as this goes on. Maybe you wanna store their roles. Maybe you wanna store their email address. That is, that is flexible and up to you. Okay, this is just a draft. Could we do both types? I don't know if it goes on there, but like a classification. Um, we did classification. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was Max's contribution. Thank you, Max. So I'm, I'm going to start name calling some folks who have, I don't think have contributed yet. All right. So what else? Comments. I heard it. Comments. Comments. All right. Where, where would we store comments? Should we store comments? In an array. Okay, so I heard in an array. What, what collection should we store comments? Bugs. Okay, yeah. We're commenting on a bug, so it would make sense to store comments. Uh, and you can have many comments, right? So in an array, I like that answer. Should we have it in another, in another collection? It could be. It could be. Again, my default is to store them together, right? Until you have a reason not to, right? So why might you not? Okay, so the one thing that I know, because we're saying a, a, an array, you don't want to have an unbound array, okay? Now, I was thinking about this, right? So like, what is an unbound array? Well, you have a bug, and could there be infinite comments on the bug? I mean, yeah, I guess, I, I guess, but hopefully it's closed before that happens. Like a bug hopefully is kind of a, you know, I don't know who would in real life, you know, it's not, a comment isn't like some like sensor that's just based on an event gonna save information. Like nowadays in the internet of things, you have these sensors that are just saving data every time someone walks into a store, every time a squirrel crosses a camera, or every time uh, a, a Tesla sees an unidentified object or whatever, there's just automatic logging of data happening all the time. But user comments isn't like that. It's not like it's automatically saving data. It requires a person to go in and actually say, like, this bug really sucks, I don't like this, fix it now. Like, is that really gonna be unbound? In theory, it could be unbound, but like in practicality, like no bug's gonna have infinite number of comments. Okay, so I'm not worried about unbounded array of comments. In fact, we could, you know, if we wanted to, we could say, hey, no more than 200 comments or something like that. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me of a Facebook post. Like a Facebook post, I mean, at the end of the day, it kind of like, falls off the feed and people stop talking about it. Yeah, you could have thousands of comments, right, on a Facebook post or something like that, but at the end of the day, you just kind of move on and go to the next post. Like a bug is temporary, at the end of the day, hopefully they fix it and you move on, you know? Or it doesn't get fixed and people give up, it's just you're stuck with it, you know? So, so I heard a couple of things, so let's talk about comments, let's bring this into our ERD. So down here, after our See, an author, there's a singular author, but you can have many comments. So, so I'll put, uh, I'll call this comments, and it's plural because it colon. The data type is an array, so I've got brackets, but then I've got a set of curlies inside of that. This is gonna be an array of objects. And what are the properties of our objects? Okay, good. You're gonna, you're, again, you're going to store the user ID, who made the comment. So again, underscore ID, which is an object ID. Now, you could make the case for making ID user ID, right? You could very early on call this bug ID the primary key and user ID. 
Um, but that's not like the default in Mongo. Mongo just calls it underscore ID. So that's a little bit cryptic when, when we just see object ID here, we have to realize that this is a user ID. Um, what else? Okay, again, if you're seeing a comment, what typically comes along with it? Thank you, a full name. So let's store the user's full name, which is a string. The actual comment. What is the comment? Comment, which is a string. Um, you put like title. You could maybe you would put maybe you would put title. Um, okay. Depending on depending on you know depending maybe and I'll, I'll I'll leave that open. Okay, I won't put that on mine. But um, yes, Scott. Bingo, bingo. Uh, let's say, like we had a created on, the bug was created on. When was the comment created? Created on date. All right. Very good, so we've got a bug, we've got users, we've got a bug author, a bug has comments, what else? And so, bingo, but I wanna hear from someone else. Someone else just repeat what he said. Hey, all right, test cases, <laughs> getting, getting participation. Um, what data type? are we talking about here? I actually, you called it test cases, which is probably the good identifier because you have multiple, but is a test case like a simple thing or is it more complex? It's more complex, right? So you have many test cases and these are complex things. Therefore, you have an array because there's many of them and you have an array of things. So it's an array of documents again. So I'll say test cases colon, I'll put my brackets, I'll put my curlies. You know, I think going back to comments, and let's let's think about this. Does this idea? See, this is part of the confusion. Confusion. I think I got. I think I might have even confused myself. There may be a need for a unique comment ID. Right. So this ID right here. I was implying. I said that that references the user ID, uh, as in the user that made the comment because that's how you're gonna link it back. Um, In Mongo, does it have to have no. I'm sorry, I should have listened, go ahead. Sorry, uh, if that would be the user ID, does it have to be the same name as the actual user's ID name? Good question, the answer is no. It's an important question that everyone, let's, so if, oops, I just double click. Um, underscore ID references the user ID. So what you can actually do you could call this user ID, which is the same value as the underscore ID of the user. That was your question, right? Yeah. Yes. The identifiers don't have to be the same. Okay, so when I kind of come down here and I see comments, this ID would be the comment ID. I could make another underscore, 
or actually we don't even need the underscore at this point. Call it user ID, which is an object ID. So each comment has a unique identifier as well as a user that made the comment. Now the author is very specifically like, you don't need underscore ID for author. Author already has an underscore ID, right? So you can see why there's no underscore ID here. But I just kind of clarified that the comment should have a unique identifier as well as the user ID. Now, uh, I think someone already asked it, could you make comments its own collection? The answer is yes, you could, right? But again, I'm, I'm trying to keep it together. I think that's a benefit of Mongo. Um, <coughs> it's storing information in one place unless, okay, unless you need to do otherwise. Now let's do a test case ID, which is an object ID. The user ID, object ID. So very similar to comments. What information do we need to store about test cases? Okay. So maybe how would you how would what would be your identifier for pass fail? I mean it's a boolean value, right? So what would be the identifier? True false. Yeah, I mean boolean, yep. So what's what's the name of our property? Pass. Okay, I'm with that. Passed. Is passed. Passed. P A S S E D. And the data type is boolean. It's going to be true or false. Passed is true or false. What else do we need to store about test cases? Where does it talk about test cases? Okay, so here's test case can be passed or failed. Should we store data on it? Bingo. Just like we had a created on again I'll, I'll, I'll do the same kind of thing here created on which is a date um, and that's probably I think that meets what we need to for now now that might change with time again that's the benefit here Well, um, so that, like you might have a message in there, right? Again, that's not a bad idea. Notice this requirement. Developers can note what version of the software the fix will be released in and when the fix was made to the code. Um, so, so, We might want to account for that somehow. Um, With that one, can we have a solve date and also a uh, like update date? A version, yeah, something something to do with a version. Um, so test case, like uh, you could say. We could have version, which is a string. That would be under test cases, though, wouldn't it? Well, you will, when, you will, when you fix a bug, right, then the test cases are passed. Yeah. 
right? And then you apply that, that fix on a version, right? So, so that's why I think, that's why I put it there, is that when, when there is a bug, the bug is fixed, you're ultimately going to apply that fix on a certain software version. F fixed in version, maybe, is an identifier? So, well, that's your what version you tested. And then I, with the bug have its own, like, you fix the bug completely for version update? Potentially, yeah. Potential. Okay. Um, What, what requirement are you referring to? Uh, Business analysts can close bugs when they are released to the customers, but all the previous information must be retained. Right, so as opposed to like deleting the bug out of the database when it's solved, yeah. you just close the bug, right? And so, what Connor said, I would agree with. We need a property of closed. So I'm going to go back up to classification right after classification. Now, closed, it gets into this double negative like closed of false, I don't know. Closed. Yeah, you call it is closed, true or false. But basically, the bug's either open or the bug's closed. Of course, you might just want to filter by open bugs. You want to see all the open bugs on your software, right? You might not want to see the closed bugs. Um, yeah. Uh, did I forget? Test, yeah, create it on test cases? Applied on date, so let's on test cases. Something like applied on date. All right, if I scroll in my elements, in my UML elements, I scroll down, get this. Get these lines uh, that represent what's called cardinality. So um, include, let's click on this line. If you double click it, we add a line here. We're going to connect these things together and show some sort of relationship. Now, um, this is the one-to-one, one-to-many, or many-to-many. -many. Okay, so you gotta ask the question kind of both ways. A you know, let's say one user, can a user have one bug, which would be one-to-one? -one? No, probably one-to-many. Um, and so we wanna represent a one-to-many with this line. Um, which I always forget the uh, syntax here of of this. Let me let me drag this. Oops. Let me double click this arrow because there's some. You can you could see a. That's not what I want.
Okay, so it took 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 me a little bit to figure out how to draw what I wanted on on Umlet. If you don't do it every day, you tend to forget the syntax. But if I'm looking at the property of my line, I have the letters LT equals, and so if I if I take the LT equals off, uh, certainly that's not what I want. So I'm not sure uh, LT equals is kind of the start of the line on the line itself is represented by this dash then you get the one this is a pipe symbol and then the many symbol is this angle bracket that is a less than symbol so one user can have many bugs um, but then you would say going the other way because cardinality is is two-way street a bug can only belong to one user right so right now you would say a single user which represents that's the one a single user can have many bugs but then you have to show the cardinality going the other way so I need to have a maybe a pipe symbol right here right so this means a single bug and then I'm gonna put a, put a pipe symbol right here okay this is cardinality between users and bugs. It's a one-to-many relationship going from user to bug, and it's a one-to-one -one relationship. One bug can have one user going the other way. Okay, so again, the, the end kind of answer there is a one-to-many one way and a one-to-one -one going the other. I guess you, you could I, I kind of wonder what happens if you put one to one going one way and one to many going the other way. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say one to many, just more or less referencing the one user can have many bugs. Yes? What are we missing in the bug? Ah, very good. Yeah, what requirement is that? That is requirement 14. Requirement 14. Developers can track the amount of time in hours that they spent on a bug. Developers can submit hours multiple times. So the idea is you can have multiple developers working on a bug. It's not necessarily a singular developer, right? So I'm thinking hours. Um, now keep in mind JavaScript has your date object which includes hours, right? So it's a date time object, even though it's just called date, it has dates and times. Um, of which you would, you know, keep track of, or, you know, uh, you probably wouldn't store this in a date time object, it's just a numeric integer, right? So this is just hours, of course maybe there's, maybe it's a float, right? One and a half hours, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm seeing an array of float is what I'm seeing here, right? Um, well, each developer, so wouldn't it be the an object? Well, so you could have an array of objects, which includes the developer ID, the user ID, and the time and hours. So I would agree with that. If you want to actually say, okay, this developer worked five hours, this developer worked six hours, this developer worked... 10 hours. So let's do that. Let's do, um, what, would, what would be the identifier? Time log. Okay. Time log, time spent. Hours wasted. Hours what? Wasted. Oh, I hours wasted. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of like time log. And so time log colon, I'm going to have an array of documents. And it's going to be a user ID, which is our object ID. And hours. 
Yeah, it's just number, right? We just have number types. Um, hours worked, maybe? Now, are you ever going to need to pull up a specific time log and say, does this, you know, maybe, maybe this time log needs its own ID? Maybe not. I, you know, it depends on the application. So I, I would say that this, this draft where we have test case ID and user IDs, well, that makes sense because if you want to just read a test case, you want to select that test case by its ID, right? But any individual log, do you need to just read one log entry for one developer? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. You know, so maybe you would leave this off here. But even then you would grab it by the user ID. Right, you'd, you'd grab all of the hours by a particular user ID. So, so that's why this is flexible, this can change, this is our draft. And we will come back to this uh, because this, this is not, uh, you know, this draft is not done. Uh, this will be ever evolving, right? But I had to give us a starting point for for this lab. Any other requirements that we missed? Do we have an assigned to? No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, so a bug, so let's click on bug. You can see these collections. It can be a big collection. Click on bug. Assign to. Could be a role because it says one of those three. Well, this is going to be assigned to a user with a role. Uh, it's assigned to a user with a role. So let's do user ID. It's an object ID. I didn't mm -hmm. know if they were talking about assigning it to a department. Ah, yeah, no. Uh, so let's say, okay, assign to user ID and maybe their full name. And again, maybe, maybe other things there, maybe not. Okay. Because this is a draft, you know, you want to be able to kind of open this document back up and continue to work on it. When you save an umlet diagram, um, which by the way, there's, there's, you know, you want to, you're going to be turning this into me. There's two ways to save it. By the way, like notice if I'm clicking here and I click off, make sure to click off. So you're not just saving the user document, right? If you, if, if you, huh? Um, we'll have to figure out why that is. Um, so let's click off, do file, save as. You're going to want to save this in a folder because you're going to be turning this in as your lab, right? So there's two ways to save it. Like saving a Photoshop document, you save the PSD and then you save the JPEG. You do the same thing here. You save the PSD, which is not a PSD, the file type is UXF. This is kind of the document that you open to work on this draft. Okay, so I'll just kind of say, I'll make a new folder. I'll call this new folder lab 0202. And I'll call this my ERD, my bug tracker ERD. Well, that just makes it so that I can close this. And if I go back into my folder, you know, I've got this UXS file that if I open up, well, let me open this up. You got to open a file, open. And then I go Labo2, I can open up the UXF and it opens up my, my file. Okay, that just, that's the file that you open up inside of Umlet to continue to work on it. But you also need to save the JPEG. So to save a JPEG, I'll do File, uh, Export As, and choose JPEG. And in the same folder, just notice the file extension is a .jpg. And here we are. Now, now we just have a regular old JPEG. Of course, you can't modify this. 
Um, so, so two, and you'll you'll be turning both of these documents in. Yeah, if you double click it, you're uh, you you got to go inside of Umlet and do file open. Okay, because unfortunately, Windows, this is not a common software program, uh, you know, where Windows recognizes that extension. If you right click, maybe do open with, uh, open with. No, it's not even there. Okay. Yep. What'd you do? You double click it and then browse more apps and then look for another app on the PC and then find the Umlet EXE and there you go. So my Umlet EXE. There it goes. You just do file export as. You know, I tell it to open. It still, it still isn't playing nice. Yeah, it's File open. open bug tracker. There we go. So again, what you do is you do file export as JPEG. Cool. All right, we'll stop that recording there.